So this month, we've been going through, uh, the theme for this month has been evangelism. So as I was thinking about the issue of evangelism, I think in, uh, there's a couple things that we need to know to be effective in evangelism. The first thing is we need to know why it's so important to share the gospel. Why it is that, wh why the message needs to be shared. So we need to have a motivation to be able to share the gospel with others. Because evangelism just means to sharing the, sharing the word of God, sharing the good news, the gospel. And so we need to know why that is important. And the second thing we need to be effective in that is we need to know what the gospel is. We need to have a clear understanding of the gospel because otherwise we'll be preaching a message that is not in line with the word of God. And the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Not our ideas, not our philosophies, not our principles, not our modern ways of thinking, but the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God for salvation. So we need to be sure that we're preaching the gospel. And in our day, I would say probably in the, I mean, in recent years, it's definitely been watered down. The gospel has been watered down. But even over the last couple hundred years, if you go back and you read men uh, from the early Methodists like Wesley or Whitfield, or you read, uh, read uh, William Booth, you know, a century later, uh, or you read the Puritans, their understanding of the gospel is much different than what we're going to hear from listening to a message from Hillsong or from Joel Osteen or from somewhere out there. It's going to be completely different from what, we're, uh, what they were preaching. And so we need to ask the question, are we preaching the gospel? So in order to do that today, I wanted to look at probably, I, I mean this sincerely, probably the most controversial verse in the Bible. Probably the most shocking verse that is in the Bible about the gospel. Uh, it was spoken by Jesus Christ. And we want to look at it and we want to meditate on it so that we can see what the gospel is and maybe how we've misunderstood it up to this point. So let's go to John chapter 3, verse 16. Now as I read this, I want you to look at it and see if you can tell why this is so shocking. Why this is such a shocking message. Jesus says this, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, when we read that, to be honest, in our modern context with all of our churchianity that we're used to, when we read this, this is not shocking at all. In fact, this is the most unshocking verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world to get him. Of course he did. He's, he's a loving God, you know, and he, he loved the world. Yeah, yeah, they're sinners, but God loves sinners. I mean, this is, this is the way it is. You know, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. This is basic Christianity, and indeed it is basic Christianity. But a lot of times we have ripped it out of its context, not only the context in John chapter 3, but the context of the Bible, the context of the revelation that God has given about himself. And so because of that, when we read this, we say, well, yeah, of course, God loves sinners. But actually, it's a very shocking fact that the God of the Bible loves sinners. That is a very, very shocking fact. And so we want to kind of just meditate through a few of the things in this passage. I'm not really going to preach. We're just going to look at Scripture and really let the Scripture challenge our view of God and challenge our view of man and challenge our view of the gospel. So that we can maybe see that, wait a second, this message is absolutely necessary for souls to be saved. And it's something shocking, but it's something that they need to hear, and they need to hear it clearly. And so the first thing we want to look at, it says, for God, Jesus says, for God so loved the world. So I want to focus on that issue of God. Now, in our day, with the Hillsongs of the world and the Joel Osteens of the world, they have belittled the love of God. They have belittled it. They have made it such a tiny little thing because they talk about it so much that actually makes it, 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 it totally erases it because they erase the other side of the coin. Because they ignore the other facts about God and why it's so shocking that he loves us. And so they only talk about the love of God and that belittles the love of God. But if we want to see the love of God in its proper context, we need to see who God is in his totality. We need to see who he is not only in his love, but also in his holiness and his anger and his wrath. 
And only then will that put it in perspective what this means, this love of God, and how amazing it is and how shocking it is that God so loved the world. And so let's go to a passage we probably do not have on our refrigerator in Nahum. Now, I, I marked it with my ribbon because I can never find it, Nahum. In the Old Testament, I'll give you a hint. It's right before Habakkuk. That should help you. And it's right after Micah. So you should find it real easy now. I gave you the, the address there. So Nahum, chapter 1. We want to read a verse about the God that we serve, the God that we love. Verse 2. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord takes vengeance on his enemies and he reserves it for his adversaries. Praise God. This is the God we worship. He's filled with anger. He's ready to pour out his wrath on his enemies. He's furious and angry. Now we might say, yeah, 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 in the Old Testament, but he repented in the New Testament. He got better, you know, because this is how we think. Even though we might not say it that way, but we don't view God. When we think of Jesus Christ, we don't think of him as furious, avenging, ready to pour out his wrath on his adversaries. But if we believe the Bible and the whole Bible at that, the Bible here says that the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. Jealous for what? For his glory, for his will to be done, for his kingdom to come, for him to be the king and the only king that is served and worshiped. But they were worshiping other gods. They were worshiping the gods of the nations. They were worshiping idols. And so because of this, he was furious. He was angry with them. And so we need to see this is the character of God. Is God love? Indeed he is. Is God a consuming fire? In the New Testament, it tells us indeed he is. It's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of the living God, it tells us in Hebrews. Because our God is a consuming fire. A consuming fire. Jesus, it says that he has uh, uh, swords, uh, or he says that flames, a uh, uh, fire coming out of his eyes, and he has a sword coming out of his mouth. And we read elsewhere in, in Psalms where that sword is comes out of his mouth to cut down all those that will not repent. So we need to understand that right now, God is angry with this world. Let's, let us soak it in. He's angry with the wicked. If we, we can go a little bit deeper, if we go jump over to Psalms. Psalms chapter, let's start in verse 5. Probably another verse that is not written on our refrigerators. Psalm chapter 5. Verse 5. Those who boast will not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. Now, in Indonesian, if you're in Indonesia, that might be verse 6, but it's in there. It's in there. You hate all workers of iniquity. So, when we read this, does that shock us? Does it shock us and make it, oh, no, God doesn't hate anyone. Well, I don't know. This is the Bible. This is what the Bible says. It says, you hate all workers of iniquity. What does it mean to hate? It means to have a passionate dislike be furious with, be angry with, ready to bring wrath upon because he's so filled with anger. And it even calls it hatred. Turn over to uh, Psalm chapter 7, verse 11. God is a righteous judge and God has indignation every day. Or some versions will say all day long. God is filled with wrath and indignation all day long. When you picture Jesus in your mind's eye, or when you meditate on the Lord Jesus Christ, do you picture him as angry all day long, filled with wrath, hating those that work iniquity? If you do not, I suggest that you might be picturing an idol, like the one that's not too far from here. There's a big old idol up on that mountain right there. You know, it's had like the Superman Jesus over there. So you might also be picturing something that is not true and not biblical. Because the, the biblical God is filled with indignation every day. Uh, flip over to chapter 11. Psalm chapter 11, verse 5. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked 
and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Is anybody using an Indonesian Bible? Ada yang pakai bahasa Indonesia sekarang? I just want to make sure it's also in the Indonesian Bible. I know it is, but I just want to get some testimony here. So what do we do with this? First of all, we should recognize, wait a second, this makes Jesus' statement a lot more shocking. When he said, God so loved the world. That's, wait a second, the God that is angry all day long, that is filled with wrath towards his enemies, that, that reserves vengeance for those who are wicked, he loves the world? That becomes, when we put it in context, it becomes something more shocking. Now, we might say, yeah, but like I said, in the Old Testament, God was kind of bad, had a bad attitude, but he's changed. Well, let's go to 2 Thessalonians, in the New Testament. 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2. Look at verse 6 through 10. Oh, sorry, it might be first chapter 1 here. Yes, chapter 1. Verse 6 through 10. It is a righteous matter with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. So it's a righteous matter for God to, uh, to pay with tribulation those that persecute the people of God. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. What's he coming to do? Verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They shall be punished with eternal destruction, isolated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at by all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. This is the Lord Jesus Christ coming with flaming vengeance on his enemies, because Jesus is Yahweh. He is God become flesh. He is the God of the Old Testament. And he is coming in anger he has reserved for his enemy because he hates all workers of iniquity. Now let that sink in because it's so hard for us because we've been taught this idea that God is love, which is true, but when we only say that, we, we belittle the love of God. Because we don't recognize that, wait a second, his love is, is, is going against all of his anger and all of his uh, anger and furiousness that's towards wicked people. He reaches out to them in love. How great is that love? How great is a love that is so strong? It's stronger than death. It's stronger than his vengeance. And it comes and reaches out to a world. And if we don't understand this about God, when we hear about the love of God and sing about the love of God, it'll be like, yeah, of course. Yeah, in, in Chinese, Li Suo Dong Ran Da, of course it is. Yeah, of course he loves us. He's a loving God. No, not of course. Shocking, amazing that the God of the Bible would love sinners, the same ones that he hates and is filled with anger towards all day, every day. This is a shocking thing. And if we don't understand this, we won't understand the very backdrop of the gospel. We won't understand how good the news it is. And we won't understand why desperately people need to hear it because the wrath of God is coming on them. It's, it's coming on them. He's coming with anger, with vengeance towards them. They need the gospel because the gospel is the salvation of God. And so it's desperate that we preach it to them because they're in the hands of the living God. And it's a dangerous thing to be in the hands of the living God. You with me? I'm reading from the Bible, right? This is from the Bible, right? Okay. We're, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. Now let's go back to John chapter uh, 3, verse 16. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world. Now let's look at the first thing that is shocking about this. In John chapter 1, we won't spend much time on this, but John chapter 1, verse 11 through 13, it says that he, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Yahweh became flesh. He came to his people, the people of Israel. They did not receive him. But verse 12, but to all who did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. 
Verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. They were born again. They were born from above. Now, what's so shocking about this? Jesus, in John chapter 3, verse 16, was talking to Nicodemus, a Jewish leader, and was telling him, he must be converted, he must be born again, or he's going to perish. And he's thinking, I'm a Jew. I'm one of the people of God. And all of a sudden, he says to him, God so loved all those idolatrous, all the idolatrous Gentiles out there, God loves them. And if they will receive him, they will become the children of God, and the people of Israel, the children of the kingdom, will be cast out. This is shocking. For God so loved the idolatrous Gentiles to Nicodemus' ears. This would be an outrageous statement. It would be an outrageous statement. But it, it cuts deeper than that, because it's not just that, you know, the, the Jews would wonder why God loves all the Gentiles out there, but why would the Jews be loved? Why would any be, be loved by such a holy God? Because if we go back to the beginning, we, we take some time to meditate. I think we did this on a, uh, we had it during the discipleship months, we, we asked this question. But, but let's ask again, what happened at the beginning? You know, if we think about all the wars, all the, the despair, all the misery, all the sickness, all the death, all the pain in this world, throughout all of history, and we ask, where did that all come from? And somebody gives this answer. Well, there was a couple, and they ate some fruit. And like, they ate some fruit? Yes, they, they ate some fruit, and then God then kicked them out of the garden, away from the tree of life, sentenced them to death, and then everything since then has been dying with them. All because they ate some fruit. And in our mindset nowadays, we would think, well, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. And so people come up with clever ideas to get around that fact, you know, that it was because of a one man's sin that the death entered the world and all the destruction that's come from it and the grief and all the anguish that has come in this world was because somebody ate some fruit. So we have to ask, well, what, what was it really that they did when they ate that fruit? Satan came to them with the same temptation he had in his own heart. We read elsewhere, I think in Isaiah 13, uh, and maybe in Ezekiel somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, but it's talking about the Assyrian and the Babylonian empires, but it talks about the kings, and it talks about them in a way like they're a cherubim, like they're a, an amazing angel that somehow fell from the Eden of God. And we read about it, it says that, they, that, that, that cherub desired to sit on the throne of God. He wanted to make himself as God. So from that, we can get a, a, a type or a picture that Satan fell because he wanted to be God of this world. He wanted to be the ruler. He wanted man to submit to him. He didn't want to be a ministering spirit sent to minister to those that are, are going to be heirs of salvation. But he wanted to rule. He wanted to be like God. And when he came to Adam and Eve, he said the same thing. If you eat of this fruit, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. And so it wasn't just eating the fruit. It wasn't just taking a bite of fruit. It was treachery. It was rebellion. It was a breaking of a covenant from a good God that had prepared everything for them, had given them every possible good thing in this world and let them have all of it and made them under him. There was nothing higher in authority under him. The only thing was, is I am still God, so you must submit to me and not eat of this tree. And how long it took them, don't know exactly, but apparently it wasn't very long because they didn't have kids yet. So we look at it and they quickly fell to sin. But what was this sin? Was it eating the fruit? No, it was wanting to be like God. Wanting to be like God. And what a shame because God created them in His image to rule for Him. But they didn't want to rule for Him, they just wanted to rule. They wanted to be in charge. They wanted to be on top. They wanted to sit on the throne of God. And so they rebelled against God. And so we need to understand first and foremost that sin is rebellion against a good God. See, in our day, and whether it's a believer, an unbeliever, an atheist, uh, you know, whatever religion they come from, if you say, what, is that a good person or a bad person? Yeah, he's a good person. He's good to his neighbor. He's honest, he's, he's you know, kind to other people, he's polite, you know, he opens the door for me when I walk in. 
Because people have a humanistic view of sin. They think sin is to disobey the command, love your neighbor as yourself. And so even people in the world will agree, yes, we should love everybody else. We should love our neighbor as ourselves. That is good, that is right. And if somebody doesn't do that, they're not a good person. But when David committed murder, committed adultery, and lied in Psalm chapter 51, he said a very, very strange thing. He said, against you and you only have I sinned. Against you, Lord, and you only have I sinned. Because when the conviction of God came, it wasn't so much that he had sinned against his neighbor, but he had disobeyed the first and greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so we can't have a humanistic idea of sin and say, well, that, that, that guy's a good guy. I mean, he's a, he's a nice guy. You know, it's kind of hard for me to imagine him going to hell. Well, does he serve God's son? Oh, no, no. He, he, hates, he hates God's son. He doesn't believe in any of that. But he's a real nice guy. He's a wicked rebel who the wrath of God abides upon. Why? Now, imagine the situation that there's a, a kingdom. I think I shared this before, but there's a kingdom. And there's a good king ruling over the kingdom. But then there is this rebellious governor that says, no, 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 I want, the, I want this land, I want this province for myself. And so he goes around and he wins the heart of all the people. And then they follow him and he rebels against them and he takes charge of that province. And in that province, he does everything good. He gives them all welfare, he takes care of them, he's kind to everybody, he's humble with them. He does everything, he is the best neighbor you've ever had. He uses all his authority to serve his people. Is he a good man or an evil man? He is a wicked and evil man. Because even all the good things that he does are used to ingratiate people towards himself and away from the rightful king. He has stolen, he has become a rebel, and he has made a kingdom for himself and set himself up as Lord against the true and rightful Lord. And so when we look at a man that is a good man, and he's a kind man, he's a loving man, but he does not submit himself, as it said here, as it said in 2 Thessalonians, he does not obey the gospel of God, then it is sure that the vengeance of God is coming on him because he is an evil and wicked man. Because he is rebelling against God. And his sins are against God and God alone. It's first against him. So we must recognize that sin is not just when we do bad things to other people. But even when we do bad things to other people, when David, as a representative of God, as the king of Israel, whenever he committed adultery, when he lied, when he murdered, he was supposed to be representing God. So by doing those things, he was sinning against God. This is why today if we say, well, oh, do we want to have a king in our, you know, over our nation? No, 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 we don't want a king. Give us a democracy. We don't want a king because kings are bad. And then we think about the Lord Jesus Christ seated on the throne as the only wise king. We say, well, kings are kind of bad. Why is he trying to control me? Why is he? Because we have a messed up view of what a king is because of men like David. Because of men that have served themselves instead of glorifying God in their kingdom. Instead of living as an image of God and showing what God is like. They've sinned against God by sinning against others. So we can't have a humanistic idea about sin. So when we say, for God so loved the world, we're saying a God that hates all workers of iniquity and is filled with furious anger reserved for his enemies ready to bring vengeance on them, so loved a, a world that rebelled against him and daily rebels against him, blasphemes him in everything that they do and boast about their own self-righteousness against him. That's shocking. That's shocking. That that God would love that world is amazing. And when we belittle the righteousness and holiness of God, then we belittle the love of God. When we belittle sin and say, yeah, well, I mean, everybody's a sinner. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just what we are. You know, everybody makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect. And we belittle it like that and say, wait a second. All men have become treacherous against a good God. And we belittle it. We also belittle the love of God. Because we don't understand how shocking this statement is. For God so loved the world. 
God so loved the world. But let's go and look even more about how amazing this is. If we go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Let's read verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if we read a, a verse before, verse 7, Rarely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. What does this mean? What is Paul saying here? He says, look, here's an example. Imagine I've got a neighbor. He's very helpful to me. If I need to borrow a chainsaw or borrow or an axe or whatever I need to borrow, he'll always let me borrow it. He never complains if I bring it back kind of a little messed up. He, he's just a good neighbor. He's always honest with me. When my kids go outside, he speaks well to them, you know. If they get into some trouble, he tells them, hey, hey, you need to watch out. He's a good neighbor. And then one day, but the problem is he can't hear very well. And so he's standing out in front of, in the road and he's sweeping out the, the, the leaves from in front of his house and there's a big semi-truck coming straight for him. He can't hear it. And I know that if I yell to him, he's not going to be able to hear it because, you know, he's getting old and he can't quite hear very well. And so this good neighbor of mine, I see the danger he's in and I run towards him. I push him out of the way. And just in time, I get hit by the car, but he gets saved. Is that the love of God? Not even close. That's not what the love of God is. Love of God... Let's, let's look at another position. Maybe this is what the love of God is. Now imagine that neighbor still doesn't hear very well, but he sure can gripe and argue and say all kinds of slanderous things and lies. He can curse my kids inside out. He steals my chains. He steals my axe. He's a wicked neighbor, a horrible neighbor. I tell my kids just to run inside if he's outside because he's a dangerous man, a wicked man. He ruins my reputation. He does all kinds of wicked things against me. And he's out there sweeping the leaves off of the, the street in front of his house, and a semi-truck is coming. What do I do then? For a good man, it's possible that you would dare to die. It's possible. It, it's a hard thing to imagine that you would die for a good man, for a righteous man, but it's possible. But what about for this man? This man who's done me all this harm. Couldn't I just stand up here and yell to him, hey, get out of the way? It's his fault if he doesn't hear. He shouldn't have listened to all that rock music when he was a kid or you know, gone to services in Monado where they play the speakers really loud, what, whichever way it is. And, and so I yelled to him. I, I, did, I did what I could do. I yelled to him. But now what happens if I see him in that situation, I know he's not going to hear me, I run to him, I push him out of the way, and just in time, he's saved and I get hit by the truck. Is that the love of God? No, not yet. That's not the love of God. Because if we go down and we look here in uh, chapter 5, we look in verse 9. Or verse, start in verse 8 again. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much more than being now justified by his blood shall we be saved from wrath through him? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more being reconciled shall we be saved by his life? There's my deaf neighbor, the bad version of him. He's a jerk. He's a bad guy. He deserves to die. I see him. I see the truck coming. I can't get to him in time. But my son is out there. The one that he's treated poorly many, many times. And I yell to my son and I say, go, he's going to die. And my son runs, pushes him out of the way. Just in time, he's saved. My son dies, hit by the truck. This is a better picture of the love of God. This is a better picture of what we're reading when we say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That he loved his enemies enough not just to give himself even. Not because they were good, not because they did anything, but he loved them, even though he was angry with them, furious with them, had hatred in his heart towards them, a godly hatred, a right hatred, one based on truth, on righteousness, not just emotion. He had that towards them, and yet he didn't just, he, he sent his son to die for them while they were his enemies, not after they repented. 
Not after they changed their ways or they humbled themselves, but before they did that, he sent his son to die. Now let's look at an amazing verse over here in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse, start in verse, can't read, 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we, he not with him also freely give us all things? What does this mean, spare his son? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he cried with loud tears to God. Father, take this cup from me, but not as I will, but as you will. Jesus once said that the Father always hears me because I always do those things that are pleasing to him. And after he prayed that with tears, sweating blood, in distress, in great grief, God stayed silent. And then again, he prayed. And then again, he prayed. All silence. God could have spared him. He said, with you all things are possible. I know with you all things are possible, but not my will, but your be, yours be done. What was God's will? To crush his son for us. So you have this angry God, filled with wrath, filled with hatred even, as the Bible says. The wrath of God abides on all that do not believe in Jesus Christ. That's also in John chapter 3. The wrath of God abides on all those that do not believe. So the wrath of God is there. It's ready to be poured out. He's got the reserved vengeance. And what's, what is he reserving his vengeance for? These wicked people that have rebelled against him, have been treacherous, have been evil, have in everything that they think, say, and do, they blaspheme God. And he is so angry, he is ready to cast them into the lake of fire. And yet, here you have Jesus Christ, his son, who's always been well-pleasing to him. Please, Father, save me. Save me. Silence. Until he's hanging on a cross, forsaken by all of his friends, by everybody, and forsaken by the Father, just left in silence. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did you not spare me? I've lived righteously. I've done everything. But you didn't spare me. Why have you forsaken me? He was praying from Psalm chapter 22. He knew why God had forsaken him. It was because this God, who's filled with wrath and vengeance, so loved a wicked world that he could not spare his son and save them at the same time. So he sacrificed his son for them. This is... A shocking passage. It's shocking that this God loves this world. It doesn't say just God loved the world. God so loved the world. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. What does it mean that he gave his son? Let's go over to John chapter 3 and look at verse 14 and 15. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but may have everlasting life. So, giving the son meant giving him to the cross, being lifted up on that, on that cross. Being forsaken by the father because he couldn't save his son and us both. Now we know that the son went into death in obedience, and because of his obedience, he came out victorious. But nevertheless, he had to go into the cross. He went in with loud cries, and the father didn't answer him before the cross, but after the cross raised him from the dead and gave him the name that is above every other name. This is amazing. And if we go on, I won't spend much more time on this, but if we go on in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, Jesus says, For those that overcome, for everyone, uh, those that overcome, I will give him to sit on my throne with me, as my Father has let me sit on his throne with him. So when it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so they might not perish but have eternal life, it's not saying so that they could be forgiven and they could go to heaven and not to hell. That's not what it's saying. If you think that's what it's saying, you don't understand what eternal life is. Because eternal life is not just that we're going to be forgiven sinners in heaven, at least we're not in hell. 
It's not going to be that. But instead, we are going to be the children of God in the highest place, seated on his throne with him, ruling and reigning with him forever and ever. What does that mean? That means that these men, this mankind, that were demons. There is no distinction between the sin of a demon and the sin of a man. Except maybe that the demons know more. Other than that, a demon wants to be God and all men want to be God. They want to serve themselves and live for themselves. And so what we're really looking at is we're looking at God taking these demons in human flesh and sitting them up on his throne and making them trophies of his grace forever and ever. That for all eternity, whatever is created will look and say, look at the glorious children of God. And then they will hear the story of who these children of God used to be. Rebels, treacherous, wicked, under the wrath of God, under his anger, ready to be cast into hell. And everybody will be shocked by John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't spare him, but he gave him so that they would not go to hell. Instead, that they would rule over all of heaven and all of creation forever as the children of God. This is shocking. This is shocking, shocking stuff. But if we don't understand, if we don't understand the context, the biblical context of who God is, of what sin is, then we will take this very lightly. One more thing let me say here, and it says, what are they to do? It says, for God so loved the world, so the angry God, the righteous God, loved this evil world, and so loved them that he gave his only begotten son and didn't spare him, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life and rule and reign with him forever. It says, whoever believes in him. What is this context? What does it mean to believe? There's some really trashy theology that goes around in our days about believe. It's just believe Jesus died and rose again. You're good. You're saved. Everything's free grace. It's all good. That's not what the Bible teaches about faith. But instead, Jesus said, if we go back to uh, John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but may have eternal life. So the serpents, because of the sin of the people, they were under the curse of God, and the serpents were biting them all throughout the tribe of all the tribes of Israel, all throughout the camp. And Moses was instructed to lift up this cursed snake, this, this bronze snake on a pole, so that anybody that came would look at it and would be healed. Now, let's think it through here. To do this, they had to believe. They had to believe that they could be healed. They had to believe that God, the one that they had sinned against would, and judged them, would also be the one that would heal them. And they had to come. They had to come. They couldn't just use binoculars in those days. They couldn't just like watch it, FaceTime with it, and they kind of see it you know, over the internet, or I'll just watch the online service. They couldn't do that. They had to, wherever they're at, they're sick, their family, they had to make this journey so that they could look, believe, and be saved. So Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. What does it mean to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? It does not mean that we just believe some facts about Jesus Christ, but that we believe in Him, in His character, and what He says, all of His commands, all of His promises, all of His warnings, whatever He says, we believe it. Because we trust in Him. We trust in His character, His ability to bring it to pass. And so here, it says uh, that if they believe, they will have eternal life. Just like when the serpent was lifted up, that they had to believe, and that faith moved them. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So, without faith it's impossible to please God. Okay? So when we come to God, when we repent, when we turn back to God, we can't come back to God just with our repentance, our changed life. No, we have to have faith because faith is what pleases God. But whenever we have faith, we'll turn back and we'll draw near to God. And what will we do? We will believe that God exists. Like the devil, we will also believe in the existence of God. We will believe that Jesus died. We will believe that Jesus rose from the dead. We will believe those facts. We must believe that he exists and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. 
In other words, we're trusting in His character. He's given us promises that if I will cling to Jesus Christ, if I will look to Him, look away from myself, look away from my own righteousness, look away from my own sin, look away from my own desires, I will take up my cross, deny myself, and I will follow Him and look to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Then I will be given eternal life. And that will move me to follow the Lamb. In our neighborhood, there's... uh, you know, when we come out on this, the little road, I'm sure many of you have little roads that you come out on, and there's always chickens with chicks. There's always chickens with chicks running. And so, you know, you, you can only wait so long for the chickens before you, you've got to get out of the road. You've got to keep going. And so I, I drive slow, but I see the, the mama chicken here, you know, and, you know, and, you know I, don't, I can't see the little chicks. I don't know if I'm going to crush one of the little cute little chickies or not. But so I go slow, but whenever I see the mom way over somewhere in the brush, I know that the chicks are with them. I know the chicks are there. Even though I can't see them, I know they're there because the chicks trust their mom. And how do you know they trust their mom? Because wherever the mom, when the mom starts running away, the chicks all chase after the mom. They all trust the mom and they'll follow the mom wherever she goes. And somebody that trusts the Lamb of God will follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Not because they're righteous, not because they fixed themselves, not because they did everything, but because they believe. They believe that he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. They believe in everything that he says. They believe his warnings that those that rebel against God are under the wrath of God and will perish. They believe it and they tremble at the word of God. They believe the commands of God that Jesus says we must submit to Him. Why call Him Lord, Lord, and do not do what He says? They believe He is Lord, so they listen to His commands, and they seek honestly to walk out their salvation with fear and trembling. And they believe His promises, that He is the rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. That this says that if you will cling to my Son, if you will believe in my Son, and you will trust in Him, and you will love Him, you will be my son, you will be my daughter. Not because of anything that you've done, but because of everything that He's done. And simply because you trust yourself to Him. You cling to Him, just like those chicks do to that mother mother hen. So let's go to John 3.16 and let's read it in its context, its biblical context. For the holy and righteous and jealous and avenging God so loved a wicked rebellious and treacherous world. He loved them so much that he gave his own son to die on a bloody cross, forsaken and alone. He didn't spare him even though he cried out and sweat drops of blood. But he died for the enemies of God and it was his father that sent him to do it. So that they would not face the wrath of God but instead they would enjoy the eternal favor of God as God's children forever and ever. And in order to receive this gift, they must be like those who recognized they had sinned against God, they they felt the wrath of God bite them, and they knew that it was on them. And so they clinged, they ran to the grace of God that was revealed in that serpent on the pole. And so like them, we look to the Son of God, the Lamb of God that takes away the sinner, well, we look to Him and we keep looking at Him and we keep our eyes on Him and we keep cling close to Him and when we fall down, we don't stay in our, the mud and mire, but we get up and we look and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. When we're walking on the water and we begin to sink, we say, Lord Jesus, save me again and again and again. We come again and again before the throne of grace because His mercies are new every morning. And we cling to Him and He saves us. He leads us out. He shows us the way because He is the way. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever should believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Help us to recognize the desperate state of this world around us, that this world is under the wrath of God, that those who are outside of Christ are going to die in their sins and be justly condemned by your wrath forever and ever. Lord, this is not your will. You are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, help us to have your heart that as you are willing to give your son, 
And now we are your children. Help us not to save our lives, but help us to give our lives to evangelize the lost, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, the grace of God, to point them to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Help us not just to bask in blessings, Lord, but instead help us to see the danger that our neighbors are in. And more than that, help us to see what Christ died for so that the Father would have a kingdom of children that would belong to him because you are not willing that any should perish. So help us. Help us to see your heart. Help us to be part of the salvation, Lord, that you bring to men, Lord. Help us, as Paul said, to fill up what is lacking in the affliction of Christ in our flesh. That is, that you gave your life to save them. Help us to give our life to share your good news with them, Lord. Help us to recognize who you are, to recognize who we are, to who the world is, to who Christ is, and what this good news of salvation is, Lord God, and help us to take it to those around us. We don't know how to speak well. We don't know how to communicate it well. We don't know how to say it all right, but just help us to have your heart at least, that we would just say the name of Jesus and say, he can help you. He can help you. He can save you. He can change you. He can, he can do it. Help us to point to the Lamb of God. If nothing else, just help us to point and say, this is the Lamb of God that can take away your sin. Help us in Jesus' name.